There's something wonderful about remembering, isn't it? I love it when I remember where I put my keys. I love it when I remember how to get home. I, I actually really love it when, as a public speaker, I remember to zip my zipper. <laughs> there are some wonderful moments when you just say, I love remembering. You know, it's kind of like, oh, I'm so glad I have memory and I can remember. I can call it back. It comes back to me. It comes back for me. And those of us who are getting a little more mature and in life carrying more distractions, sometimes we're just like, thank God for memory recall. Thank God for the ability to remember my name. And some days we have those moments where we can't even do that. But we're grateful that there is a recall, an ability to remember. And sometimes we just have to put into action this wonderful power of remembering. Today's text that you all read so beautifully, coming from John 17, 5, says, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory uh, we had before the world began, the glory I had with you, the glory that I had in the, before all of time. What is Jesus saying? In his beautiful prayer, this beautiful prayer of oneness, he's calling forth and saying, I want to remember where I came from, the wonderful glory I had before the world began, the wonderful power and presence, the wonderful journey. This is the source, my divine beginnings, where it comes from. Now, everything we find within Scripture is there for us. It's an example in Jesus' life being a great example for us. And written in Scripture, it's their design not just to be a history book, not just to explain something that happened thousands of years ago, but for us to learn from and to make application, for us to find ourselves within every Scripture text and to find that truth is to be our truth. For as we look at Scripture with power and meaning for coming alive, we find ourselves there and we find every text is our text every text is our story this is our story Jesus praying a prayer that we too may pray let us remember where we've come from let us remember our source let us remember our beginnings I want to hear my say hey I know how I got here my mom and dad well we won't go into that but uh you know we think that that's our beginnings of our physical body that's the beginning of that physical container that holds the real you. You are not this physical body. You are something even more. We speak about it that we are spiritual beings having a physical experience in this realm. That's who you are. You're this wonderful soul. The essence of you is far beyond this physical container. This container will pass away. We all know that. It is a, there's a sort of a limitation on this, uh, the timeline that these bodies have for us. Yet the soul is eternal. Always has been, is right now, always will be. Now that's kind of interesting as we think about this in the essence of what it means to experience this eternal life. We were with God. We came to this world. We will be with God. This wonderful eternity that goes on and on and on is our life and is our life journey. Now, in this prayer, we find that Jesus is saying, I was one with the Father, with the divine source before I came. I'm experiencing that now. I want to refresh. I want to remember. Help me in this moment remember that I may recall, that I may be awakened to the glory, to this divine oneness, this sense of that I was always with and still am and always will be. Now, this prayer is everything for us because it really starts out with defining where we've come from. And in prayer, this is a great time to experience that awakening to it. We call it sitting in the silence or meditation. You know, it's really uh, kind of a foreign thing to so many to think about prayer being being quiet because we think, well, there are words of prayers. We recite prayers. We learn prayers. We think we speak prayers. We need to talk prayers. We need to tell God something in prayers. And we're not really being eloquent and refined enough if our prayers don't have beautiful words. One of the great prayers is to be in silence, to be still, and to know God. To be in that silence, to awaken a knowing that says, let me remember where I've come from, that I was with the divine and I'm still with the divine. Because we know, Scripture says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. 
The Spirit of God never departs from us. It's we who have lost the awakening, fallen asleep, slumbered, lost the awareness and the consciousness that the divine presence is flowing in and through us at all times. So in prayer, in the silence, in this moment of really communing with God, we awaken this awareness and we become just like Jesus that says, oh God, let me remember, let me be awakened to the glory of what it was before you and I before the world began to be so wrapped up in the divine presence. Because let me tell you this, the really essence of God is not just the head knowledge that we may experience in our classes, coming to worship, to learn, but the experience of feeling as well, to feel this divine presence, to feel that it's with us each and every day, that we awaken to this wonderful good that flows in and through us in a sense of feeling, God is with me right now. I have nothing to fear. I have nothing that, I can, uh, that comes to me as an obstacle I can't overcome. There is no challenge so great we are, understand that where we come from is so powerful. We understand this is our beginning. And we've not left the essence of our beginning to come into this realm to be a living being within this world. We've not left that oneness. We've not left that divinity. We've just come into a physical realm where we have the opportunity to express it, to live it out. So it's really important that we know where we've come from. How many of you have stopped someone and said, hey, where, do you, where are you from? Where do you come from? On Sunday mornings, quite often I'll ask guests, where are you from? And, you know, I'm thinking, like, what suburb of Atlanta are you from? But many people say, oh, I'm not from Atlanta, because they go into their history to say, I'm from Louisiana, or I'm from Puerto Rico, or I'm from another country, or I'm from Michigan, or I'm from another state, and I moved here because it seems like no one is an original Atlantan anyway. So we're always asking that question, where are you from? I want to invite you to say that the universal response says, I'm from the divine. That's right, that's where I'm from. And that unites us all. We are all from the same place. We all come from that same divine source. The soul within you, the real you, the essence that is you. We've all come from the divine source. We've all come from the same place, from the same beginnings, from the same origins. And how wonderful it is when we understand that. For when we think of God, God is this circle whose center is everywhere. Wow, now picture that. The center here in a big circle, but the center is there with a big circle. The center is over there with a big circle. And in that, there is no circumference. The circumference is nowhere, for it doesn't end. So in that, we find we are all within the divine, each and every one of us. And that helps us paint this picture of understanding this word, oneness, oneness. That we're all in this. We're all in this together in the divine realm, in this wonderful power and presence, this love that's called God. We may find that some people may feel at times, I'm outside the love of God. Oh, but the love of God has always been there. You just may not be awakened to that divine presence. You may have felt that you're outside the realm in some shape or form in the journey of your life somewhere along, but know that within, God has never left. It's just we've lost this consciousness. We've, expe- we've left this sense of a oneness of mind and thought and begin to welcome a duality of thought. A sense of two, that there's inside and outside, that there's not just being within this circumference and the realm of all that is the good of God. Prayer brings us back to this state of oneness. For as Jesus prayed this beautiful prayer, let me be remembering my source my place of beginnings. Let me remember it so that in this moment, I also may live from that sense of oneness when I face great challenges and obstacles. This week, we in America faced a lot of challenges. We've seen crime, murder, gunmen at a Kroger grocery store shooting two African-Americans, pipe bombs being distributed to those who people have felt as an adversary to their views. We've experienced most recently the crime at the synagogue and the mass murders of those who've gathered together simply to worship. 
We find that in this realm of a world of all kinds of adversary and division, and it seems like a world of hate creating the walls and barriers, we want to say, where do, what do we do? How do we face these challenges? What do we do? Let me say that the great hope is this prayer Jesus prayed. Let me remember. Let me remember where I came from so that I might understand that the divine presence is here with me, never leaving nor forsaking me, offering me all the hope, the promise, the power, the strength, the spirit of encouragement and the outlook to know that all things are working together for good. Let me find this because once we, rep we understand this spiritual oneness that we're all in, it changes the dynamic of our world. What would it be wonderful if we woke up every day and we began to proclaim and begin that day with this mantra, we are all one. We're one in God, one with one another. How different our whole experience may be that we drive down the road thinking we're all one and we share this highway together. And we're all one at the store and we share this experience together. And we're all one at work and we share this experience of work together. But we have a consciousness to say there is not a separation. Even though we live in a world that's always trying to find ways and reasons and means for separation and division, we know when we remember, it changes everything. For that oneness is the very root of every religion. Interesting that we may say the commonalities we find in our spiritual journeys as we look through all the great religions of the world. And I invite you to come on December the 2nd for the Taste of Faith and inquire about everyone's context and understanding of being in this sense of one. There is one God, one power, one presence. When we understand that we're all dwelling and working in it, though we may have unique expressions, diverse ways of looking at things, that's our uniqueness and our unique expression of the infiniteness of God. Isn't it wonderful to think God's in you and you and you, but expressed in unique ways. God's expressed in different hair colors, different clothing choices, different styles and manners of speech, different ways of approaches. That's the uniqueness of God being expressed through each and every one of us. But when we understand this, we see that every world religion speaking of this wonderful sense of teaching that we are all in this that one plus one always equals one. Now, that may be hard to comprehend. Wait a minute. One apple plus another apple, we want to say is two. But in the divine realm, we begin to comprehend one apple is one with the other apple, and it always equals one. The God in you and the God in me always equals one. The God in you and the God in you always equals one. When we understand one plus one is always equaling one, it's transformational in our hearts and our lives because we begin to experience that remembrance that we all came from the same place. We all understand the divinity within us that God dwells within everyone and our calling is to awaken it and to start the awakening within our own individual selves and let it transpire and flow and transform the world around us. We love this wonderful awakening of oneness because it's the core of who we are at City of Light. 46 years ago as a metropolitan community church, we experienced this wonderful message that in God there is no second class person, meaning we're all one, we're all equal. No one be treated as a second-class person. And people who lived out on the margins are always welcomed equally because we're all one. And one straight person met with next to one gay person, next to one transgender person, next to one bisexual person, next to one tall person, next to one short person, next to one African-American and one Euro-American and one uh, Asian and one who may be of a Hispanic background, that combination is still one, still one, still one. And the beautiful addition of the unity congregation affirming that message because what is the word unity? What does unity mean? One, one. Scripture says that when they gathered together in the, on the day of Pentecost, they had tarried in Jerusalem, the disciples waiting in an upper room, praying for a period of time, seeking this wonderful spirit of presence. But it says, when they all came into unity, 
or when they all came into one accord. And I won't use my old joke, they all got into the Honda Accord. First mention of a car. I will want you to understand they all came into the awareness that were one. In that upper room experience that transformed those early disciples who launched the birth of the Christian movement, they awakened and they started with this wonderful understanding of unity, of oneness. No one is a second-class person. No one is less than, not some hierarchy on some lower uh, levels of people in the dynamics of the spirit of God. There was no separation, no divisions, not some better and some less than. It was all in a sense of unity. That's this wonderful merging together that we celebrate in the teaching that we live out here at City of Light. What we understand is that this thought, of this awareness of oneness is a paramount to the importance of our soul's progress because the soul is here on this earth to live out oneness. That's right, to live out unity to live out its divine purpose, that there is the divine, the divinity within me, and I want to reveal. I need to show. I need to be the hands of God, the voice of God, the feet of God. I need to be the physical expression of the divine in this world. That's what you're called here to do. So it's important that we awaken and evolve to this understanding that we every day uh, proclaim that God within us that we proclaim that, that our calling is to be the revelation, that our calling to be as Jesus, who said that when you see me, you see the Father. How wonderful it is. When you see me, you see the divine source, is what he's saying. When you see me, you see the revelation. That's our story too. Wake up and tell the person next to you, when you see me, look for God, because here I am. And how wonderful it is. Now, I want you to turn to the person next to you then and say, good morning, God. Because isn't that what we all are? You're the revelation of God. Good morning, God. Good morning, God. Isn't it wonderful? People say, I went to church and, oh, you know what? It wasn't very exciting today and I didn't really feel that God was there. I said, was there someone else in the room? Whoa, were you all alone? And even if you're all alone, God was still there. And then other times we'll say, oh, but we sang, we shouted, we jumped up and down, we shaked a tambourine, we had hallelujah time, we did a Holy Ghost dance, we did whatever it may be. And they say, oh, God showed up. And I said, what? You acknowledge that there's people in the room? Because God is within. We understand that. Not without, Within. Jesus taught over and over again, understand the kingdom of heaven is within you and you are its revelation. So when we look to one another, we say, good morning, God. God, it's so good to see you. God, oh, you're looking fabulous. God, look at you. You've expressed yourself in a wonderful way. God has uh, blue streaks in the hair and I love God's expression in that way. Uh, I love God's wonderful idea. God wore red high heels today. Isn't that fabulous? Isn't it wonderful when we look around God? God has gray hair and it's like fabulous. God has highlights. Oh, wow, we look at the diversity and the expression because we're seeing God and remembering the divinity within us and we're expressing our oneness and how powerful that is. We understand that when we say I am one with God, that word with kind of throws us off a little bit because the with almost su su suggests some separation. We're looking for words within our English language and we kind of struggle because we kind of think I am here and I'm with something else. And so we're trying to see what, how do we express that? I am in God, I am God. In Swahili, the language that I expressed for years of my upbringing, uh, that there's a beautiful word called pomoja. I grew up in Kenya, and there we uh, expressed the word pomoja is meaning the word with, but it has a whole different context. Because in America, you might say mashed potatoes with gravy, as if it's two elements together. But once you said mashed potatoes pomoja gravy, it's now a whole different entity. 
It's not two things, it's one combined. Now it's something brand new. You don't even look at it. It's no longer gravy. It's no longer mashed potatoes. It's something new. And so that word has its beginnings and its origins in the expression of oneness. That when we're with God, when we're Pomoja God, when we're in God, it's not me, the human, the physical being, and that the divine and the spiritual, but instead, I'm Pomoja, I'm one with. There is no separation, there is no division. The life force that is divine, that which is the energy of God, that which is the divine presence of God, that which is all as good and holy is now within and flowing from me, that's who I am. And what an amazing awareness that is because all of this kind of illusion of separation is just this mirage that's not really true in our lives. It comes from the fall of man that we may have heard and been taught within ancient scripture texts from the book of Genesis of the story of of the Garden of Eden. And we think of that in the sense that, well, they were walking with God, dwelling with God, in God. But yet then suddenly there becomes this opportunity to eat of the tree of good and evil. Suddenly the oneness is now two-ness a duality. That was a oneness of thought of mind. I am in God. I am with God. I am in the divinity. But the temptation came to create this illusion to eat of this fruit. And that fruit was a consciousness or a way of thinking that there's a good and an evil. Not just a good, but a good and an evil. And that division, that duality created the separation Because we've talked about this over and over again, but we can't reiterate it enough that we understand that when there is light, there is no darkness. When the room is fully illuminated, where does darkness go? It's gone because it has no power of its own. Evil has no power unless you give it power. It's gone. It doesn't exist. Have you been in an argument? And if you stop talking in the argument, where does the argument go? It's gone, isn't it? Does it have a power of its own? Does the energy of the argumentative nature have a power of its own that it goes on even though you both have walked out of the room in your argument or your discussion? No, it doesn't. It's when you stop giving it power, it dissipates, it's gone. Drama, it disappears in our lives when we stop feeding it and giving it a power. Evil has no power of its own other than what you're willing to give it. So when we understand our oneness But truly the story of the Garden of Eden comes back to us, that we're moving back into the garden to the understanding that we're one with the divine. That's where we belong. In this wonderful oneness that is our natural state. It's where we belong and has been there all along. For the very story of the prodigal son is the story of the Garden of Eden, I find. Because there one wanders away. The prodigal son leaves the presence of the father, leaves the beauty of the home, the comforts and all the dwelling of there to go off and say, there's got to be something other than this good. Let me go explore it and give power to it. Adam and Eve living in the garden, in the father's home, you might say, in the dwelling of the father, the divine source, then there's tempted to say, wait a minute, let me taste of something else. Let me go out and explore. Let me eat of good and evil of this tree, of this fruit of this tree. And you see, the prodigal son story speaks of that son leaving, squandering all of his inheritance, all the money and funds he'd taken, and then thinking, wow, could I go back home? Could I, could I? And the beautiful thing is the story tells us of the father always waiting, never leaving nor forsaking. The father always being there, the divine source and presence of God always there. You may wander off. You may venture off and give power to some evil. You may give strength to some sort of drama. You may be involved in chaos and the challenges of the world. You may venture off for a while, but God, the all good, has never left you is with you, waiting, waiting for you to reawaken or to come home or to return back to the garden, to come back to the place where you belong. 
So we find that all along the feeling of oneness comes from this direct experience with God, this experience with the presence of God. And how, how helpful it is when we look to the Psalm of 23rd chapter of the book of Psalms for us, unfolding that beautiful passage, the Lord is my shepherd. I'm one. The shepherd is that which is guiding me. I am one, and there is this beautiful internal GPS. I love that. Eternal guidance that says, here, go here, here to go there, move here, move there. Because quite often we don't know where to go and we don't know how to move exactly. We don't have a 10-year plan laid out for us. We may think we do. We may try to plan it and then circumstances changes everything. How many of you said, I'll be in this job for the next 10 years and only to find you were laid off two years later? How many have said, oh, I'm going to be with this partner? And before you know it, you discovered they've left you. Oh, you may have thought this or that. This may be your intentions, but we find that we don't always know what the future holds. But the spirit, the shepherd, the very essence of the divine within us is always there to lead us and guide us. And it says he leads us through, the, through paths of righteousness, even in the valley of the shadow of death being led, being guided by this sense of oneness of the divine within us, that though we may face all kinds of challenges, that our shadows in the world around us were moving in paths of righteousness, meaning right thinking, awareness of the divine, clarity of thought. We move then through these shadows. How many of you have seen our logo? And underneath the logo, you'll find in several different publications the saying that says, City of light, illuminating with love, removing shadows. That's what we're doing. We're illuminating, shining bright the love of God. And what happens when the light goes on? The shadows disappear, don't they? Shadows are gone. Shadows are there in dark and dim spaces. Shadows are there when there are obstacles that are in the way of the light. But when we remove those obstacles, when we remove that there are no shadows, those shadows of questioning areas of doubt and fear, those shadows that may seem scary and filled with all kinds of challenges in our world, they're gone when we illuminate with love. And this is the beautiful word of the psalmist that says that the divine GPS, that oneness that you know that's within you, that presence is that leading and guiding you, will take you through the valleys of shadows, shadows of death, which may seem to be finality. Oh, but they're not. They're not final. They're just shadows that look scary, that look like, oh, this looks like the end. This looks like the problem. This looks like chaos. This looks like something I need to worry about. This looks like something I need to be afraid about. It's just a shadow. And that shadow is disappearing as the very love and light of the divine shepherd shines within us and leads and invites us to follow. Here's the key thing. The scripture didn't say that God says, yeah, I'll pick you up on a tram, just get on board and I'll take you places. No. It says, you walk, you follow, you go behind. You go behind step by step knowing that the divine presence is with you. The way shower, as scripture may say it and call it, showing you the way, the divine presence unfolding for you. You have to do the walking. You have to do the exercise. You have to do the unfolding of this awareness that says, I know that I know that I know that I know. I'm one with God. And God's presence is here with me, never leaving nor forsaking me. Why do you think Jesus was so passionate about this sense of oneness? Because if you read the chapters in the book of John unfolding his prayers, oh God, may they be one like you and I are one. May the world awaken to this oneness, that the divine in me is the same as the divine in you because I have proclaimed greater things that shall you do than I do. These are Jesus's words attributed to him in the Gospels, inviting us to understand that something greater is expected and anticipated. Why was Jesus so passionate about oneness? Because oneness is the answer to every problem. Racism, what's the answer? Oneness. Say it to me, we remember we are one. Racism, we remember we are one. That's the answer. What's the answer to famine? We remember we are one. What's the answer to injustice? We remember we are one. What's the answer to poverty? 
We remember we are one. What's the answer to inequality? We remember we are one. What's the answer to war? We remember we are one. What's the answer to division? We remember we are one. Now you know why Jesus was so passionate about it. And why we as a church are passionate about this concept of unity, of oneness, of being together, of being awakened to the power of God in us. Because as we walk in this world, we don't walk as just human beings. We walk as lights for the world. To illuminate someone else's pathway. To shine some light on them. That their shadows may dissipate. That their fears and the things that they worry about and that are within them that may be concerns and challenges for them are removed. Because this is the great truth. This math mathematical wonder that one plus one in God always equals one. Always. Crazy math. Divine math, beautiful math, holy math, sacred math. We're all part of the whole of one life. I am in God and of God. I am. You are in God. And of God, we are all together in this essence. So in times of challenge, we're called to remember our glory. For Jesus said, help me remember my glory. I need to remember this moment. Just as you prayed, help me remember where my keys are. Help me remember the way home. Help me remember my name. Help me remember to zip my zipper. Whatever it may be, we're remembering our glory, how important it is. We're remembering the divinity, our state of good and of divine. So let this be our prayer. Divine source, I now remember where I came from. I came from divine love. And that love is in me, through me, all around me and ever for me. I am one now. I am one forever. For one plus one always equals one. Amen.